Hey guys, this is Ivan and this is a brief introduction to white dwarf cooling. Now, if you're anything like me, when you think of stars, you think of main sequence stars. So in that sense, white dwarfs aren't really stars at all, but star remnants. As we've seen in class, stars have more or less three distinct fates immediately following their main sequence life, which essentially depend on their mass. We will only concern ourselves with the byproducts of the death of a low mass star. By low mass, I mean something between 0.5 and 5 solar masses. Now, think back to the class where we estimated what the radius of a white dwarf should be in terms of a bunch of stuff. We plugged in some numbers and got a value that was about 11,000 kilometers, which is roughly Earth-sized. So these are pretty small objects considering their mass. But I'd like to point out something else about th this formula. Note how the radius is actually inversely proportional to the mass. So white dwarfs get smaller the more massive they are. Now keep this in mind because it will come back later. Since a white dwarf is held up by electron degeneracy, once it forms, pretty much all it can do is radiate away its thermal energy. And in 1952, Leon Mastel published a relatively simple and, by today's standards, surprisingly accurate cooling model for white dwarfs. We begin by writing down the energy equation, neglecting any energy generation due to fusion. The next step is to use a thermodynamic identity. Now, the nice thing about solids is their volume doesn't really vary much with temperature, so we can get rid of this term. We can also write down the heat capacity of the ions in the core. Next, we argue that the core is isothermal. We can say this because thermal conduction for the generated electrons is very efficient. We combine these assumptions and integrate over the core to get the luminosity of a white dwarf. Note that the time dependence is restricted to this term. But before we can relate this to time, we're going to need a better understanding of the composition of a white dwarf. And although the core is composed of degenerate matter, white dwarfs are coated with a layer that is non-degenerate. So heat must propagate through this layer by photon diffusion, which is very inefficient. This envelope acts like a blanket surrounding a hot brick, keeping it insulated. To deal with diffusion, we use Kramer's opacity law, which describes the opacity in terms of the density and pressure of a substance, with K0 being some fudge factor. Using appropriate boundary conditions, we can write down the temperature as a function of the pressure. The next step is to argue that at the boundary of the core with the envelope, the generacy pressure must equal the ideal gas pressure. This allows us to write down an expression relating the luminosity to the temperature at the core. Replacing it into our first luminosity equation and integrating with respect to time yields the cooling time to reach a given luminosity. Note that using the luminosity corresponding to the faintest observed white dwarfs gives about 10 to the 10 years, meaning the first white dwarfs must have formed around 10 billion light years ago. If we say arbitrarily that it becomes a black dwarf at a temperature of 5 Kelvin, we can use Stefan's law to obtain a corresponding luminosity of 10 to the negative 17 solar luminosities, which gives a cooling time of roughly 10 to the 19 years. Note that 5 Kelvin is warmer than the CMB is today, and is much warmer than the CMB will be in 10 to the 19 years. So let's look at a couple of features of this equation. First, the dependence on A implies that cores made up of heavier elements cool faster than cores made up of lighter elements. Secondly, more massive white dwarfs fade more slowly. This is due to two reasons. More mass means a greater reservoir of thermal energy, and they have a smaller radius, and therefore a smaller surface area through which to radiate away their energy. Alright, so just how accurate is this analysis? It turns out we neglected quite a few things, some of which are kind of important, such as neutrino cooling. Neutrinos fly right, up, right out of the core, and under certain circumstances, neutrino energy loss can exceed photon luminosity. We've also ignored effects of crystallization on the heat capacity. But, as it turns out, these effects more or less cancel each other out. This ensures that the Mistel cooling model is within 30% of modern techniques. White dwarfs are an interesting field of study because, while their evolution is simple, they just cool. Also, 
The coldest white dwarf can place a limit on the age of our galaxy or even the universe. And everyone is familiar with concepts concerning the birth and death of the stars and even the birth of galaxies. But what about the death of galaxies? Surely there must be a point in which a galaxy has radiated away most of its energy. Well, this is one topic where white dwarf cooling plays a major role. Some even conjecture that proton decay could fuel a black dwarf at a rate of about 400 watts for over 10 to the 40 years. But that's another presentation entirely.